Historically, we've had three separate um, military pipelines to do medicine. Um, we all, while we're all doing the same thing, we all function a little differently. And so the Defense Health Agency was, um, I believe it came out of the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, but it was a new uh, joint three-star position created. Um, right now it's currently in Air Force Lieutenant General Rob, but it's going to rotate among the services to kind of serve as the parent organization to help us as we become, I mean, this is a joint base, and so we see a lot of other services, and so where our policies are a little different or don't sync up, sometimes it creates challenges that we try not to pass on to the beneficiaries, but it can. Um, so the Defense Health Agency is just gonna help us become more, more um, similar in what we do um, with unified policies and help us cut through some of the, the stuff that makes our job challenging service to service. For me, at my role as the commander, it's, it's the balance of I run a peacetime healthcare operation here. You know, I've got patients coming in and out um, in a peace care setting, and so I expect our clinic to run efficiently and effectively um, with great customer service, um, like we would expect any healthcare organization to run. Um, balance that with the operational requirements we have. Um, so, you know, an example I would use is, um, you know, recently when the president wanted us to help with the Ebola fight. Um, you know, we sent a flight surgeon to Liberia. She was the first Air Force medic on the ground. And so she had, um, and she left very quickly. And so she had a full slate of patients. So she's seeing, you know, people and families and just taking care of, oh, you've got a cold, you've got a sniffle. And so she's seeing them and that's, and that, and we're managing that clinic operation. Um, I had to go down to her and say, what's your afternoon look like? And she says, you know, I've got a slate of patients. She said, well, nope, we just had to move them. Um, you need to go pack because tomorrow you're on a plane to Liberia. And so it's that aspect of our mission that is really super cool, but also creates challenges when you're trying to run a peacetime healthcare practice. Absolutely. Absolutely not. So at the, at, the, at the point of care, if you're a beneficiary of Department of Defense Medicine, you come in, that you know, re retiree, family, Army, Navy. Um, on this base, we even take care of Coast Guard, even though the Department of Transportation, they're still considered one of our active components. Um, treat all the same. Um, the difference becomes in, in, in the paperwork part, in the back end of what we do with them and how we track what we do with them. Um, the systems are different and it just is not as user friendly as it needs to be and DHA is gonna help us with that. So I would say the answer is yes. I mean, all of the above. Um, I have a squadron commander who went through the Air Force Academy and then decided he wanted to be a physician and went to, and went to medical school. And he was an officer of the United States Air Force the entire time. Um, we have civilians that come out of medical school and decide, I'd like to join the Air Force, and they join. A unique experience we've had here is we had a contractor we hired who was a, she was a civilian family practice provider who we hired as a contractor to do family care here and just being around us. She loved it so much, she said, you know what, I want to take a commission. And so she sought out a recruiter and, and we were able to get her a commission and now she's right now in training down at Maxwell Air Force Base to come back and, and, and be a major in the United States Air Force. So medicine is basically medicine, and I would say I would say no on the surface level. I would say that obviously every service has some different requirements. Our physical fitness test is different than the one they take in the Navy. Um, a Navy physician that's going to go to sea might have had some different level of training for the operational mission of their service. Um, but from the healthcare side, no. The healthcare the healthcare is the same. Well, I would start that answer with they help us. You know, um, I mean, what a great, what a great group of Americans. And so we take care of them. We provide their health care. We do our best to treat them like we treat every patient and take care of them. Um, but they're usually the ones that are coming in with the biggest smiles and thanking us for what we're doing and continuing their legacy and their tradition. And so they really see it that way, which is validating for our young folks. And so um, it's an honor to take care of them. But they, uh, they pay that back tenfold. So I think we'll be here. Um, there's certainly a need for us. Um, our primary mission is to be able to support our fighting of our nation's wars. And so um, we are expensive. Um, we continue to take up a larger chunk of the Department of Defense budget. And so at some point, um, just like we've seen in civilian examples, you know, with General Motors and others, at some point that becomes a, that becomes a real problem. I mean, you know, when, we, we, when we can't buy airplanes and we can't buy guns and bullets, 
um, because of our benefit structure, then that's a problem that we're going to have to solve. So maybe down the road we would see changes to our peace, peacetime healthcare structure. Um, we've talked about that for years, not sure. The military medicine side of what we do, the ability to um, go into Afghanistan and take a casualty from the battlefield within an hour and get them on the OR table um, and, and move them by air, uh, extremely critical patients, and just the, the unique things about what we do um, will sustain and will always be there because that's what we need to, to fight our nation's wars.